Hey guys, how's it going? Hello. Uh, we have now been at the co-op for what, two and a half days total? Well, I haven't because I showed up late, stylishly and fashionably late as always. Um, although apparently not to this lecture. Uh, I hope things are going really well. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about an issue very near and dear to my heart. And that issue is disads, a.k.a. real negative arguments. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, disads have become somewhat unfashionable in recent years, uh, but I think that uh, we can turn that around together if we really put our minds to it. And that's what we're going to try to do today. Um, before we dive in, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show you like an old Whitman casebook. Uh, because I think that one of the uh, challenges, I, certainly for me as a coach, it was an enormous logistical challenge figuring out how to organize and develop a research strategy. And I really think that most of this lecture is going to be about less kind of um, from prep time to the end of the MO, like in-round tactics and, and argument development, and more about how to think about disadvantages, how to research them, and how to uh, put them together in a way that's both coherent, uh, logically sound, and useful in the future. So as a result, I wanted to show you an old Whitman casebook um, that I think we did a pretty solid job on. It's from the Nukes topic at MPTE a few years back. Um, and this includes like AFs, case negs, MG answers, um, and of course dis ads. Um, and I thought that we would just go over it really briefly, use the like, live table of contents so you can just hit control, click, and move to a specific argument. Um, and table of contents are extremely helpful. As you can see, we did not cut anything for topicality, and this argument is laughably bad. So don't be overwhelmed. Um, but uh, I think we had some really good stuff in here as well. Um, and I just want to show you... This was our like go-to nukes disad, uh, PGS, it stands for Prompt Global Strike. And um, the way we cut it, this is the LOC shell. And a lot of people think that the LOC shell is like all that you do when you write a disad. You just write down what the LOC says. Nothing could be further from the truth. The LOC shell should be like a relatively small portion of the total argument that you're going to end up putting together. Um, it basically just contains the key components of the disad as they will be presented in the LO. Um, and as you can see, that's fairly short. It actually fits on a single page. Um, but then, attached to it, we have extensions to critical arguments, um, and we've got impact calc like, built in separately. Um, and there's actually somewhere in this file is like a separate link module. Um, that like explains exactly how we read links to this disad under a wide variety of circumstances. Um, I am a big fan of cutting cards to learn what is actually going on in the world. Um, this is not like widely done in Parley, per my understanding. Uh, but here is the version I cut. I just cut cards for our latest version. I cut an updated version of the disad that absolutely no one from Texas Tech used because we were too interested in Deleuze and Guattari for MPT this last year. Um, which is just like cards cut, but it's the same basic idea, right? Um, and I have not formatted it quite as well. Uh, but the reason I'm showing you this is I want you to have some idea that it takes a lot of work to put together like a good disad that will be reliable for you in a wide variety of situations. Um, the more work you put into it, the better off you're going to be. Um, and the more you know, particular answers to particular arguments, uh, the better off you're going to be. So, uh, that's going to be kind of the thesis that underlines this whole lecture. So, let's start talking about this ads. Um, first of all, uh, I put together a little slide that I didn't actually finish, I realize now, um, about what you should know and what we're going to be working on during this lecture. You should not be in this lecture, probably, if you do not yet know the basic structure of a disadvantage, meaning uniqueness, link, and impact, and what those three words mean. Um, you should probably not be in this lecture if you don't yet understand the difference between offense and defense. Not that, you know, you're not special and, like, capable of learning these things very rapidly. I just want to make sure that we're not, like, talking over anyone's head. Um, so I will provide a 30-second refresher. Uniqueness means what, Megan? Okay. Uniqueness means um, <laughs> how the world looks in the status quo, i.e. the impact is not occurring in the status quo. Link means that the plan alters what is happening in the status quo, and impact is why that alteration to the status quo is bad. Um, offense and defense, offense is a reason to vote for your team. Defense is a reason not to vote against you or not to vote against the other team. Understanding those things will be very important. 
what we're going to be talking about, since I didn't actually put the bullet points in, uh, is basically, first of all, how to kind of approach researching a dissad, how to come up with ideas, the various components of a well-researched dissad file that you'll want to put together. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about like a series of um, somewhat disorganized like tips and tricks um, for executing a dissad uh, successfully. That I think that if you apply them all in all opportunities, your your dissads will be far superior than they are today. So first, let's talk about researching dissads. Um, when I want to cut a dissad to a particular topic, I ask myself a couple of different questions. The first is, who does this plan piss off? or who is likely to be pissed off by the plan. And the second is, what can they do about it? Um, if the answer to the what can they do about it is nothing, it usually means that they're a marginalized group, and we've got an impact right there, um, because it's like racist, classist, sexist, or, or something along those lines. Um, if the answer is that they can do lots of things about it, then they're probably the Republican Party and its politics to say. Um, and if it's somewhere in between, then you know we have to be a little bit creative. Um, when you are looking for a, a disadvantage, you need a lot of sort of background knowledge, I think, to actually make a meaningful and interesting argument. And partly, one of the big advantages available to the negative is being unpredictable. Uh, but you cannot be unpredictable if you only put in 20 minutes of reading, uh, because all you will find is the surface level stuff that is incredibly obvious. Finding a good disadvantage requires knowing a topic fairly well developing your understanding of that topic and finding the stuff that is not available in the top 10 hits on Google. In fact, if it's in the top 10 hits on Google, you can bet that a good affirmative team is going to have answers to your argument uh, and it ceases to be a good dissent fairly quickly. Uh, another thing that you want to think about is because um, to par topics change every single debate in Parley, um, you need to strategize how you, you allocate your time. You cannot spend like 15 hours, two days before a tournament, cutting a dissad to a single negative. Um, it's just not practical, it's not feasible, unless you've got an army of qualified researchers on your team and each of you is taking a different topic, which may be possible and is nice. Um, but what you're generally going to need to do is find dissads that can be applied to a number of different scenarios or circumstances. Um, so if you looked at um, if you looked at like a PGS dissad in the nukes file, right? We've got link modules that allow us to read the prompt global strike dissad against not just nuclear related topics, but also any cut in defense spending and any decrease in like high tech sector spending. So that uh, that dissad is actually applicable in a number of different scenarios. We can get a lot of mileage out of it, which makes the research worth it. Uh, we'll talk about how to kind of build those link modules out and apply dissads in unexpected circumstances uh, as we move forward with the lecture. Um, researching a good dissad is a lot more than just writing the shell, as I mentioned. Um, these are five things that you will definitely want if this is going to be a dissad that you're going to rely on. And I should make clear that I would not cut all this stuff for any random dissad. Um, if it's going to be something that is, sorry, if it's a particular case neg, uh, meaning that it is a negative strategy designed to deal with one specific affirmative, for example, like ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, then I probably would not go to all of this work unless I just had ample amounts of time before the tournament. But um, if it's a dissad that I want to be able to use like three times throughout the course of a 12-round tournament, assuming we get to finals, which obviously we will, uh, then I would definitely want to do all this. Right? If it's going to be repeated, I want it to be good. Um, so uniqueness walls, uh, that would be extra evidence that says your dissad won't occur in the status quo. You want to be able to load up on that and make it impossible for the affirmative to be there. Link variety, expanding the usefulness of your dissad to lots of different scenarios. Impact modules, which allow you to turn and outweigh uh, the case with specifics. Impact calculus, written out beforehand to tell you how to evaluate a particular impact. Um, and I'll get into each of those points later. Uh, and MO answers, you know, identifying common responses and writing answers to those responses and extensions of the initial shell. Um, if you have a favorite dissad, which many of you will, often it's like a politics dissad, though not necessarily. You know, guys from UT Tyler ran econ in like every single conceivable debate that they could. Um, you will want to constantly improve upon it. I highly recommend, just like if you're a K debater, you should save all your old K flows and see how people are answering it. Same goes for a disadvantage that you are likely to repeat. Um, you know, my partner and I, when I was debating, ran elections like constantly in fall 2008. Yes, I'm that old. Don't do the math. 
Um, and, uh, you know, we, it was like every single time we debated elections, we were a little bit better than we were the last time because we'd done a little bit more research. We figured out how people were going to respond a little better. Uh, and, it, you know, it was damn near impossible to beat us on it by the end of the year. Uh, and then the stupid election had to actually happen and ruined my whole week. But. <laughs> um, okay, so that's researching this ads um, and sort of a basic philosophy and kind of a direction that you may want to take. Um, so now I'm going to get into sort of different tips and tricks. Um, and these are all things that I couldn't figure out quite how to organize them into like a broad map, but each of them is useful in its own way, and I think that you will uh, enjoy them. So uh, the first is using predictive uniqueness. Now we know that a normal uniqueness argument is an argument that describes the status quo. Uh, it just says, hey, here's, how the way, here's the way the world works today. Predictive uniqueness describes what the world is going to look like in the you know, near or even conceivably long-term future. Um, so an example would be that uh, the latest GDP numbers show that the United States economy is growing at a rate of, say, 2% a year. Okay, well, GDP, uh, as a statistic, is a measure of economic growth that has already happened. It tells you what the economy did over the last X period of time. Um, now, that is useful, but it's not nearly as useful as our predictive example, which is that the leading economic indicators, abbreviated as LEI, rose two points last month. Uh, the leading economic indicators are fantastic for debaters who want to debate about the economy because what they do is they measure a series of statistics like future orders placed by companies to giant manufacturing firms um, and, uh, and things like that which purport to measure the direction the economy is moving uh, in the near future, in like the three to six month time frame of the future. Um, I think there are like seven different statistics that are considered leading economic indicators. They're all bundled together into an index and like the numbers are crunched. Um, LEI is pretty good at predicting the future. I, I think it, it's accurately predicted the end of six of the last seven recessions, something along those lines. It's not perfect, but it gives us some idea of what is coming. Now, why would this be valuable in the debate rounds? Well, it's extremely valuable because when we are attempting to evaluate what the effects of plan will be in the future, what we really care about is what we're comparing against in the future. Um, a normal uniqueness argument like GDP just gives us a one-day snapshot of what the economy looks like today. But uh, if we have an argument that says the economy is about to skyrocket, right, and then the plan would result in it simply plateauing, then that's evidence that the plan has done something wrong, that the plan is a bad idea in that circumstance. Um, likewise, if there's evidence that the, uh, that the uh, GDP numbers or whatever are about to fall off a cliff, that we are about to go into a devastating like economic depression, and the plan would leave us in a world where it just plateaus, then all of a sudden that plateau looks pretty great. Okay? So this is why predictive uniqueness matters, because when we are making uniqueness arguments, what we're doing is enabling a comparison of the plan versus the status quo. The more detailed that comparison is moving out into the future, then the more relevant those arguments are. Um, and uh, the, the greater the sort of import of our, our way. Um, so, other examples of predictive uniqueness arguments being applied, um, these work extremely well on things like politics dissents, and anywhere, they're actually very common on the econ debate, which is why I use this example, but they're less common on a lot of other sorts of dissents. Um, predictive uniqueness arguments will totally troll your opponent. Um, Here's a good example on a politics dissad that um, you know my partner and I used to read quite a bit, and we would occasionally sprinkle into dissads when I was coaching at Whitman. You make the argument that X bill is going to pass. You list off you know a bunch of senators and Congress people who support that bill, and then you sneak in a little argument there at the bottom of the uniqueness block that says that lobbyists are now starting to rally support behind this cause. They're essentially going for finishing. And maybe make some argument about how campaign contributions from lobbyists associated with the industry that supports the bill have risen dramatically over the last couple of weeks and will continue to rise. So what's great is the other side comes along and they read like a whole bunch of weak old quotations about how Boehner isn't actually going to allow a floor vote or whatever. And we stand up and say, aha, 
We control predictive, issue-specific uniqueness. You can see that the lobbyists are massively upscaling their efforts to get this bill passed. They haven't had a full impact yet, but they will over the next two to three weeks because this is the primary project that campaign money is focused on. And then we would read a bunch of additional evidence about how um, you know, those lobbyists would be extremely successful at convincing congressmen to support this bill afterwards. So what is so great about an argument like that is it allows you to bypass all of your opponent's facts, right? It doesn't matter that they have an accurate description of the world and the status quo uh, because we have an argument that the world tomorrow is going to look much different um, and it's probably going to look much brighter. This means that we are able to overwhelm our opponent's blocks. It doesn't matter that they have cut like 16 reasons why John Boehner will never allow a floor vote. All 16 of those reasons assume the world as it is today. We've made an argument that the world will be different tomorrow, which means that your 16 reasons no longer apply. Uh, it also allows us much greater argument flexibility to use predictive uniqueness. That's because um, the world is today as the world is today. Like, we can't make the argument that it is actually raining in Bellingham today. Um, it's not possible to do. We are constrained from making that argument. Um, similarly, uh, you can't really make a credible argument that the U.S. economy is in a recession today. Um, it is pretty clear that the U.S. economy is having some growth. That growth is like stagnant and sluggish, but it's positive. You certainly cannot possibly win, and keep this in mind, members of government, that the economy is in a depression today. That's just not possible. So you have to make predictive arguments in order to uh, leverage you know, uh, a major, excuse me, marginal change relative to the status quo, right? This is why when an MG responds to like an econ dissent, they always say, non-unique, the economy is going downhill in the status quo. It will continue to trend that way. What I'm saying is apply that sort of intuitive argument from the econ debate and put it in tons of different contexts, right? Make arguments that Japanese-U.S. relations are going to crash at some point in the status quo or are going to improve radically in the status quo uh, because we're considering some new free trade agreement with them or something along those lines. Make sense? Questions about predictive uniqueness? Okay. A useful argument that I hope you will deploy. Let's talk about uniqueness link combos. I couldn't really think of anything else to call this, um, but I think it will make sense. Um, a lot of the time in debate, we rely on sort of broad generic arguments and broad generic blocks of arguments interacting with one another. Uh, and I think this is a great example of that. Imagine an econ dis ad where the native stands up and says, the economy is growing 2% a year in the status quo, but the plan raises taxes on corporations, and that is going to result in them you know, stagnating, not wanting to invest as much money, attempting to hold back their savings, etc., which leads to our double dip recession, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all of that is fine. All of that is a properly structured argument. But the problem is it's incredibly generic. Um, and it means that if the MG has done literally any research on the economy at all, all of their arguments will apply. Um, everything that the MG knows about this economic growth number is going to be totally relevant in the debate. They can stand up and say, aha, yes, you're correct that economic growth is occurring in the status quo, but the following critical sectors are actually declining, you know, housing and high tech and uh, biotechnology, et cetera. Um, and all of those sectors will ultimately drag down the rest of the world, right? They can make some sort of predictive argument about how everything is going to turn to crap in a few minutes um, or a few weeks or months or something along those lines. Everything they know will apply. Now look at the other scenario. Okay? The other scenario says, leading economic indicators projects massive economic growth driven primarily by recovery in corporate manufacturing orders. Corporate manufacturing orders are super fantastic for the economy, we might say, if we were advancing this dis ad, uh, because they, A, facilitate you know, more job creation in the manufacturing sectors of the economy. Um, B, they tend to create um, sort of positive feedback loops because they, the corporations, when they order lots of manufacturing, um, they tend to increase their own efficiency, right, because they get better trucks or better, um, better equipment uh, that helps them do their job more effectively and drive down prices, et cetera whole bunch of arguments about why that particular stat, corporate manufacturing orders, is really valuable. And then a link argument that the plan taxes corporations, which motivates delays in those manufacturing orders for some reason. Now we have a much stronger, much more specific argument. 
Because now, it does no good for the MG to stand up and make arguments about what general GDP numbers are doing, right? We have a specific scenario, and if they want to have a good answer, they need to be able to respond to our particular argument about corporate manufacturing orders. <coughs> Um, another place this works really well on like an econ dis ed is in like the housing market, right? Tons of reasons why the housing market is critical to the economy. You make an argument about why the plan directly affects the housing market, and you have a much stronger uh, link argument than you would if you just stuck with sort of broad, big stick generics. Um, so uh, the important thing to note too is that the uniqueness argument and the link argument are directly tied together. Um, it does us no good to uh, make this argument about uh, you know, economic growth being driven by manufacturing orders if we do not then read a link argument about how the plan results in less manufacturing orders. In fact, um, if we read some other link argument that had nothing to do with this, then we would have read an alt cause to our own disad. Um, we would have been like, manufacturing is super duper important and your plan has nothing to do with it whatsoever. So perhaps that is like a reason why the plan does not actually harm the economy, right? So the uniqueness and the link argument have to be paired for this strategy to work. Um, that's why I called it a combo. C combo, yeah. Is that kind of where you pick like different LA, specific LEI indicators that kind of like piece them together for like some sort of narrative? Yeah, yeah. I think that would be that would be a typical strategy. Yes, look at sort of predictive indicators and be like, what's going to be super important. Yeah. Um, so you're saying here, how would you tag on? So you're going to say that uniqueness plus link, or are you just going to say? Oh no no no. I'm these are these are tags, you know, completely the same way that you always would, okay. right? It's just in terms of your argument construction, okay. like before the debate even happens. Um, so yeah, and these would also, I should point out, in a complex like detailed disad, um, these would just be two components. Like, I would ideally have, like, three different reasons why the economy is recovering that are all this specific, and then three different link arguments that interact with those uniqueness arguments, okay? And we're going to get to that when I talk about multiple pathways to get to the same impact, um, which is in just a minute. But I want to do a couple more examples of this, uh, I believe, yeah. Um, a few other, uh, here's why it's important to do this. First of all, um, generic responses become a lot less useful, as I talked about. They also provide for a narrower focus, which is much harder to link term. You can't just say, our plan helps the economy. You have to say, our plan helps manufacturing orders. Our plan helps the housing market, et cetera. Um, anyone who's given the MG knows that the latter is much, much more difficult to think of. Uh, right? Your pre prep blocks don't do you much good against specific knowledge. Um, in absence of specific knowledge, you're just going to play hell or human to be with. Um, it also, and this is not a bullet point that's up there, but it also makes life much easier on the MO. Because my favorite thing to do when I am giving the MO, um, and this works especially well since uh, in most of my practice debates, I also give the LO since I'm debating my debaters. Um, I love to make the argument in the MO that you have just made a series of interesting but totally irrelevant claims about the subject, right? Uh, it is just absolutely fascinating that your plan would be helpful to poor urban minorities in search of housing that has absolutely nothing to do with our argument that you collapse corporate manufacturing orders resulting in the collapse of the economy. Um, what is fantastic about being able to do that in the MO to render their arguments irrelevant to your argument is that they don't get another chance, right? Any other scenario where the MG makes an argument and then you refute and respond to it, the PMR ends up with the last word. But if instead of responding to the MG's arguments, you can just be like, sorry, you didn't answer our dissent right, well, then the game's over. There's nothing the PMR can do about that situation. There's no weaselly little trick they can pull off unless their name is Susan Ellie. <laughs> um, yeah, and she uses spells, so it's not even the same. Uh, a few other examples of where this could come up in politics, say. Um, one of my favorites in politics was to, uh, you know, isolate like a particular senator and then read link arguments about that particular senator. Um, this worked fantastically well when there was, a, there was a while, I think in like 2007, 2008, when Joe Lieberman was an independent and the Democrats controlled 59 seats in the Senate, which meant that Lieberman was the 60th filibuster-breaking vote. So this was just like politics city, right? We, we just knew everything about Joe Lieberman, right? We knew everything that would piss him off or irritate him. Uh, and we would just be like, basically, 
Plans are only allowed to pass if Joe Lieberman likes them. That's the new rule. Uh, because otherwise, Joe Lieberman will do something awful that will end in nuclear war. Um, and, I mean, it was a really effective strategy, right? Because basically, none of your generic link turns, if, I, if I'm making a ton of arguments about like, why Joe Lieberman hates your app, you can't just respond and be like, well, moderate Democrats generally like it. It's like, well, we have like 19 different examples of Joe Lieberman backlashing against things exactly like your plan. Uh, which is not beatable. Um, so, you know, the same thing might be doable with, like, Marco Rubio on the immigration bill. Like, Rubio's support provides cover to a whole bunch of other moderate Republicans. It helps bring them on board and, you know, gives them the appeal of, like, acquiring more of a share of the Latino base. But if a plan alienates Rubio, then maybe he backs off immigration. Or maybe uh, Rubio has to run to the right as a result of uh, the passage of a left-wing plan because now the GOP base is all alienated. And that causes a bunch of Republican congressmen to jump ship, something along those lines. The more particular and specific you can get, the better. Um, a relations example would also apply here, right? We might make the argument, and this is rather obvious, but Japan won't rearm now because of U.S. security guarantees, and then make arguments in the link level about how the plan weakens confidence in U.S. security guarantees. That's a much stronger argument than a general Japan doesn't like your plan. Uh, type link argument, which is what we would do in sort of novice level debate, right? Japan likes the United States now. Plan means Japan doesn't like the United States anymore, so Japan acquires nukes. It's not a particularly compelling argument. But this allows us to get into the specifics of like the Japanese security apparatus, their particular motivations, uh, etc., uh, which creates a much stronger argument. Uh, does this make sense to everybody? Cool. So specificity is awesome, uh, is another way of phrasing this. Uh, independent pathways to impacts. These are also really important and allow you to just like slither around and stab people in the back. Um, again, one of my favorite, absolute favorite things to do. Um, the goal in writing a diss ad, and you know, this is always my goal in putting together a generic diss ad that we want to use a lot, is to have at least two different routes to the same diss ad impact on every single diss ad. Um, basically, I want like two or three different diss ads like woven together into my one monster diss ad. Um, it's like what's it what's it called when the Power Rangers unite into that one giant thing? Megazord. Uh, Megazord, yeah. But then like if you need to, you can like break up Megazord and like they can all do their independent. Um, so it's exactly like that, uh, except with arguments instead of Power Rangers. Um, Actually, when would Megazord even be that relevant? <coughs> when you're fighting something really large? Yeah, yeah, also the big monsters at the end of every episode. episode. Yeah, I guess, totally how many episodes do they actually go Megazord? I feel like it was <laughs> all of them. Right? The whole season. Yeah. They like throw the monster after the fight. They yeah. say, like, oh, the monster's now twice its size. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I never actually watched Power Rangers as a kid. I was trying to adapt to my youthful audience, yeah. and then uh, hopefully it worked. Yeah. Drop money first, but then, uh, Oh, nice. The other thing I was going to say, is this one, is this sort of like when uh, people say you want like horizontal links and then uh, vertical or like vertical impacts? So like many different, is that kind of what they mean? That is debate lingo with which I am not familiar. Um, I don't know what a horizontal link or a vertical link. Well, it's more like each each link by in and by itself can get you to the impact. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Want impacts to then like ramp up as you go. Over yes, like, yes. That makes total sense. So I talk about this as like a necessary or sufficient condition. Uh, but yeah, same, same idea. Okay, yes, cool. correct. Um, okay, so the rationale here is that um, if you have multiple pathways, then it's twice as hard to answer and also facilitates a collapse in the MO. Right? If somebody has loaded down one portion of your diss ad, you can just kick out of that portion of the diss ad and go all in on the other that they totally mishandled or dropped. Um, and this can be very effective. The trick is that you want to be making arguments that basically set up uh, necessary conditions but not sufficient conditions to cause or avoid an impact. Um, you want to set up necessary conditions but not efficient conditions to cause or avoid an impact. And what I mean by that will become obvious on the politics this ad uh, example. So let's say X bill is going to pass on the status quo. Uh, it's relying on a fragile coalition of both Democrats and Republicans, okay, probably centrists from both party are going to unite and pass a particular bill. What this means is that it is necessary, presumably, for both the moderate Democrats and the moderate Republicans to be on board in order for this bill to pass. 
Um, it is insufficient if just one of them is on board. It is necessary for both of them to be on board. Um, without both of them, it can't possibly pass. So that enables us to read link argument, the plan alienates the GOP, they don't pass the bill, but it also enables us to read link argument, the plan emboldens left-wing Dems to push for a harder bill, um, because perhaps it's a win for the left wing, something along those lines. One of these can be false and the other true, and we still have the impact of not passing the bill, right, in either case. That's the beauty of it. The MG must answer both of these arguments independently, or the bill will cease to pass as a result of the plan. Um, and, you know, you can set this up with politics to say uh, really effectively. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make arguing politics to say is that they um, only argue it from one perspective. They read a bunch of, like, GOP backlash links, and they don't think about how the other side will react. Um, this is pro tip, also fertile ground for um, any member government who wants to link turn. Instead of answering their GOP backlash arguments, read some uniqueness arguments about how like Democrats are fractured, and then link turn with Democrats become united by the plan or whatever. Right. Um, so reading links from both perspectives uh, allows you to operate independently. Uh, Japan rearm will be another example. Um, Japan will not rearm in the status quo because A, they have improved relations with China, uh, and B, uh, U.S. security guarantees give them a lot of confidence. We would want to articulate these in our LOC shell as necessary but insufficient conditions. Um, necessary but not sufficient conditions. So um, improved relations with China is not enough by itself to prevent Japan from rearming. But the combination of improved relations and U.S. security guarantee, that is sufficient, right? It's like, well, we don't have anything to worry about. Um, that sets us up for link argument, plan kills China relations, uh, Japan-China relations, and link argument, uh, plan kills confidence in U.S. security guarantees. Um, either one capable of triggering the same unique impact. Um, it's not just a uniqueness link level where these multiple pathways can exist, though. You can also do it on the internal link level. Um, we had a dissad called uh, ABL, Airborne Laser. Did anybody in here ever debate that, I wonder? No? It would probably just be Megan. Um, yeah, fun one. Um, so airborne laser, um, I don't think I emailed this myself, so I won't be able to show you. Um, the airborne laser argument says that, okay, has anyone ever heard of the airborne laser testbed program? Oh, it's friggin' sweet. Um, it is like a 747 uh, that, like, we rip the guts out and we put in a giant chemical laser that shoots a beam the size of a basketball out of its face. Uh, and the idea is this thing flies around and melts nuclear missiles. Um, and it, there's like a YouTube video of this happening, it's, it's pretty sweet. Um, but um, it like doesn't really work at all. Um, because you have to be within like 100 kilometers of the nuclear launch, you have to know when the nuclear launch is happening, um, and even then it like sometimes the laser gets too hot on the inside and causes like a little fire. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of problems with it. Um, and as a result, Congress was like ready to defund it, right? So that was our unique argument. Congress defunding the airborne laser testbed program the status quo. Link argument, the plan results in renewed funding for ABL. Um, and then we would read a bunch of internal link arguments about how that derails, uh, uh, derails uh, relations with China. Because China really, really doesn't want us to have giant flying laser beams capable of shooting down their weapons. Um, now, the logical thing for the MG to do, if they were relatively informed about the subject, would be to point out that China is not threatened by the airborne laser program because the airborne laser does not work. Um, in particular, you would have to have, like, 100 747s all flying around China simultaneously, um, like in Chinese airspace, in order to effectively use these things in a combat situation. So they pose no actual threat to China. The MG would be wise to point this out. That's why we had a second internal link argument that said China would get freaked out if the U.S. continues developing ABL, not just because they're scared of ABL, but because they are scared of future directed energy weapons that the United States might be able to develop as a result of this, right? Um, and then we would talk about how the massive uh, amounts of resources being poured into ABL seem to suggest that the Pentagon thinks that there are a lot of different applications for this technology, um, and, you know, the possibility of putting, like, giant lasers on satellites in space or something along those lines um, that could pose a much more serious threat. So what would typically happen is the MG, in their haste to write out like the awesome answers that they just got to why China isn't scared of airborne lasers, um, completely misses this second level of the internal link. 
Um, and now we've got like a moderately extended time frame to our impact, but it's still like boom, right there. And typically drop, typically can see it. Um, so multiple pathways or independent pathways of impact can occur on all sorts of different um, parts of the debate. Always think about how to build in sort of redundancies and contingencies into your dissat. Think to yourself, okay, what would I do if an MG had like seven answers to this exact argument? Is there a way that I can weasel out and still win this debate without actually having to win this particular point? Um, in an ideal disadvantage, in an ideal disadvantage, there is no one argument that an affirmative team can make that will save them. There's no one argument that an affirmative team can make that will save them. You always have the ability to sacrifice any one particular component. Um, you're like a lizard that's made out entirely out of tails. Yeah. But also has a head and the ability to eat, I guess. You probably don't eat. I guess you'd use a tail as a leg, hypothetically. Um, moving on. Uh, finally, and this is seriously like, a, if the other stuff feels like too complicated or too difficult for you to implement in the short term, this is the one that you should do today. Uh, start doing today. Disad turns outweighs case. Um, what this means is that you should always be able to read your disadvantage in terms of the affirmative team's impact, okay? Um, you want to cut different impact modules, we call them, for your disad in as many different areas as possible. Um, Cut your modules in as many different areas as possible. Let's say, hypothetically, um, that we have a, a giant disad about um, prompt global strike or, or econ, let's say. Um, and the affirmative's whole case is about race, gender, and class. Okay? Well, it's really good that we got to an external impact about the economy that is not just about race, gender, and class. right? Because now we have something independent and separate to weigh against. Uh, and that gives us the ability to make direct comparisons across those issues. Um, and we can probably attempt to outweigh race, gender, and class. We can read impact defense, et cetera. Great news. But that's not all we want to do. We also want to put our econ impact in terms of the affirmative. And we want to use it essentially to, that, that functions as kind of a non-unique to the impact of the affirmative. It's like, you solve race, gender, and class. Well, that's fantastic. We do too, but we do it by protecting the economy. So we might make some argument along the lines of, um, when economic downturns happen, they tend to affect uh, minority or traditionally disenfranchised groups the most. You know, for example, black people tend to be the first to get fired in the middle of a recession. Uh, unemployment among African Americans in the United States is upwards of 20% right now, whereas for white people, it is like 6% or something along those lines, maybe a bit higher, I'm not sure. Um, but you get the idea, right? Couch your impact in terms of their impact, uh, and it allows you to basically mitigate their impact. Uh, because it's like, well, black people are screwed either way, so I might as well save the economy, is what that boils down to, kind of unfortunately. But you get the idea. Um, so these are like a few areas where you would definitely want to have arguments cut. You're not going to be able, necessarily, without a lot of creativity, to get each one of these different impacts out of every single this ad, but you want to get as many as possible. You want as many different ideas as possible. So if you do, it sounds like you've got a typewriter. Yeah. It's kind of awesome. Um, it just sounds like an exact transcription of what you say. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Did you transcribe the thing about the lizard with the, uh, all the tails? And the sword, too. <laughs> yeah, I got the lizard. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Um, so, so here's an example um, that I came up with just a few minutes ago. Um, this is from our airborne laser uh, argument, right? The primary impact to airborne laser was like China relations or Russia relations or something like that. Uh, but then, you know, we also cut some other examples. Um, so, for example, we made the argument that airborne laser would kill the economy uh, because uh, increased tensions with China would result in China banning rare earth uh, metal exports, rare earth element exports, uh, to the United States or substantially restricting them, something along those lines. And then we had a bunch of reasons why they would do this, one of which is the airborne laser needs a bunch of rare earth elements in order to function properly. Um, and then we would talk about how that would crush the U.S. high tech sector uh, and also how it would result in potentially sparking a trade war between the U.S. and China. What's super effective about this is if the MG comes along and reads a bunch of impact defense about how China will not go to war with the United States, well, we now have an alternate mechanism that allows us to achieve some impact anyway. 
we can concede no nuclear war occurs at some point in the block and still be okay because now we have a case term. It's like you thought you solved the economy, actually you make it worse via uh, this process of steps dealing with trade with China. Um, another example, ABL kills the environment. Um, chemical lasers are actually major, major polluters. You have to put, put all sorts of nasty stuff into those things, not to mention the fact that you have to mine for rare earth elements in order to build them in the first place. Um, plus, in order to actually use ABL effectively, you would need to keep a fleet of 747s circling in the air pretty much constantly, um, which would probably not be great for the environment. So if the AF reads an environmental impact, we're going to read that. Um, how this works, uh, by the way, and you might have seen it as I was skimming through the PGS dissad, is we put all of those different impact modules in the file that the dissad lives in, and there's usually a note. There's like a star or an asterisk that's like, here's the primary impact file, and then um, what you're supposed to do if you're the LOC, uh, or perhaps the MO, depending on how we want to allocate our time, is you read the other impact module in response to the affirmative, right? So you pick, like, okay, which extra impact module do I want to tack on to this disadvantage? Oh, they've got an econ advantage. That's the one I'll pull out and put in in this particular circumstance. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, this is incredibly strategically valuable because when most people are doing impact calc in the rebuttals, they're going for, like, economic collapse is worse than nuclear war or better than nuclear war. This allows you to say economic collapse and nuclear war is worse than just nuclear war, right? It's like two for the price of one. Right. Cool. Questions about this? All right. Let's talk about MO extensions. I did not put very much on this slide because most of it seems sort of intuitive to me, but maybe it will not to you. It's also less uh, easy to generalize about because what MO extensions you will need is highly dependent on the dissent that you are writing. Um, but the first step is to identify likely MG blocks. Figure out what the MG is going to come and say to you, uh, and then prepare to respond to it. Uh, then you want to write out detailed, warranted answers. Warrants being the key. One of the facets of parliamentary debate is that the actual like evidence content of every speech diminishes, right? The PM usually has the most actual evidence. The LO has the second most. The MG might have some if they prep the right stuff. And then the MO usually has zero, um, and followed by the LOR and the PMR, which, as we all know, are just speeches for pretty talking and not actual debating as a double member. Kind of got a chip on my shoulder. Um, okay, so, so the more like actual evidence you can introduce into the debate as the MO, the better off you are going to be. Like, you can just face crush an MG that seemed like he or she was really on target if you can just be like, oh, no, I have facts. Like, actual things that are from the real world um, that apply. Uh, people will be very impressed and not know how to respond because MOs typically don't do that. Um, and then you want to write them down in prep time. Um, what we would do, um, typically, uh, you know, the MO is sort of like your flexible person in prep time. They typically don't have a lot to do, or uh, depending on your team, uh, they, they may or they may not. One of the things that I really encourage teams to do is if you have a dissed that you really like, that you're developing and working on a lot, have the MO know that dissed inside and out. Have the MO know exactly how to respond to all of the MO, uh, MG responses that are likely coming, and have them know all of the warrants that are buried throughout the shell, so that he or she can like mix and match, make the critical extensions at the critical time. Um, I want to show an example of like how we cut answers to this. Um, PGS, do we have enough? Yeah, okay, here we go. So there's the PGS this ad, MO extensions. Um, we knew a bunch of people were likely to say uniqueness overwhelms the link, meaning that uh, Congress has already made deep cuts to the PGS program, means that uh, there's no risk of PGS becoming revived. So we have answers that say, hey, actually, it's still a little bit alive, right? Those are those two arguments on the top. Um, then we have an impact extension argument. Um, the, the impact of prompt global strike is basically that China and Russia think that we're accidentally going to attack them because that's sort of the way the missile design works. Um, so uh, that gets responded to a lot by being like, uh, oh, no, the Chinese and the Russians, they trust us. They're, they would never think that we're going to attack us and just launch all their nuclear missiles back at us for no apparent reason. Um, so we had three or four particular reasons. It says three reasons, but it looks like we actually have four. Um, I'll go ahead and edit that. 
Problem solved. Oh no, it didn't change. You don't protect your view. Oh, outrageous. Oh well. Um, just pretend that it says four instead of three, and I hope that you won't judge me for uh, having it wrong here. Um, so we got specific reasons, and then um, impact turns were another problem that we were relatively concerned about. Um, so we've got a bunch of answers to impact turns plugged in there. Um, for different disads, it'll be different, and I'm wondering if I've got, oh, Allied Prolif, right? Um, this says Japan is going to start building new nuclear weapons. So we've got answers to all of the likely arguments that are going to be responses to that disad. Um, Constitution prohibits, no one cares. Mean some rolls link, totally not true for arguments that are all written in neat capital letters. Um, I also recommend if you're not already formatting your files in something like this, you should definitely do it. Having table contents is extremely valuable in prep time, and having um, a system where everybody bolds certain things and like underlines certain things is also really valuable. So you can quickly absorb key information without getting bogged down in like lines and lines and lines of text. Um, so definitely consider something like that. Um, and you can see, like, this this end took a pretty good amount of work to, uh, to do. I wonder who cut it. Oh, here's another example, since we've got the file open, of cutting links to lots of different areas. Like, we would never read every one of these link arguments in an actual debate. Um, what we do is read, like, the first, yeah, we would read the number one link argument for sure, because plan is U.S. doing something unilaterally. That's just a stupid generic link argument that most MGs will be capable of handling very easily. Uh, but maybe they won't, so we leave it in the shell and we go for it. The second link argument, plan incites conservatives to attack the strength of U.S. defense commitments. That's a pretty broad and generic link as well. As long as the plan does something that alters the United States' defensive posture in East Asia, we can probably use that link argument. Um, and then we get into much more specific links. NFU means a no first use policy on nuclear weapons. If the U.S. were to adopt that, Specific policy, we have two specific reasons why the plan uh, would, you know, trigger a Japanese rearm scenario. Same thing goes for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, same thing goes for reducting, reduction in U.S.-Taiwan relations, etc. So you can see, like, basically what we would do in prep time is figure out, okay, which of these link arguments is most likely to come up in this debate, circle star them, get them on the flow, uh, and those are the ones we roll with. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Uh, and I believe there's one more thing. Oh, nope, that's it. Um, okay, so just to sum up, um, as you are cutting disk ads, uh, you need to be doing a lot more work than you're probably currently doing. You need to think about the round from a much more strategic perspective. And as a result of this, I actually recommend that if you're dividing like AF, neg, AF prep and neg prep, I think that the MO should generally be the person primarily responsible for cutting negative strategies. Um, and on the AF, it's sort of more flexible. I think it's whoever is not the MO uh, should cut the affirmative strategies just to divide more work more fairly. But I think it's essential for the MO to really, really know their stuff inside and out on the arguments that you're most likely to go for. Um, you should think about those arguments strategically. You should always have multiple pathways to every impact. You should always write arguments in such a way that you can overwhelm the other side with warrants. And you want to be in a position where you don't have to actually answer any MG arguments. You can just dance around them, render them irrelevant, uh, and then mock them in the LOR for four minutes for not being smart, smart enough. Um, okay, so that is advanced disads. Questions? I got done a little bit early, so we could definitely talk. Oh, I didn't really. I got done four minutes late, technically, but that's okay. Yeah? Just a curiosity, what are some of the like uh, conventions you would have for like formatting within a, a big file like this? Like what is the stuff that would get underlined how would you tag certain uh, That's a good question. Um, <laughs> so this is a Whitman file and um, I just edited everything at Whitman because it could not get everyone on the same page ever. <laughs> um, but so basically it would be organized into AFs and then AFs is like specific AFs, like a plan text and an advantage with that plan text. On some topics, we had generic advantages that would apply to anything under that. Um, then you've got like MG answers, case next, disads, as you can see. Um, typically, on like a disad shell, um, we would use like an F6 tag, meaning something that shows up on a detailed table of contents, but not like a broad one, for the basic thesis of the uniqueness link and impact argument. Um, and then, like, a bolded, underlined sentence for, like, a key claim, and then warrants are just, like, uh, in plain old type. 
there's no like one correct way to do this, but Megan is raising her hand. Yeah, uh, if you wanted to find some sort of universal document that had these keys in it, where would you find that? There's a Jim Hansen? Um, <laughs> yes, Jim Hansen will uh, probably be willing to provide you with a template that is exactly how I wrote this document. What's really nice about an ex uh, a template like this is that um, you, if you, you just need a keyboard with the function keys on it, right? And what you do is you highlight a block of text, and this, for example, is an F2 uh, highlight, I believe. Is that right? Maybe it's F5. If you're using the wizard. Yeah, you're right. It's F5. Is the wizard still on Well, I don't actually know. Um, I have not used a template in quite some time because I don't have the cut arguments anymore because there are 18 assistant coaches at Texas Tech. Um, but yes. Um, basically, it's like that is a level one header that has some hotkey. Um, this is a level three header that has a different hotkey. And this is like a level four header or something like that. So basically, it's just pre-described, and your whole team can easily use the template and put it together to be on the same level. Yeah. Good call. If, you don't, if your team doesn't want to or know how to create a template, if you Google verbatim paperless debate, it's a policy template, but a lot of the keys will still help you format things. And it's very easy. They have like a whole manual of how to install it and how to use it. There you go. Writing a template on your own, I think, would be a horrible pain That's in the ass. Terrible, terrible um, like, it's not an easy thing to do. But you should be able to find them on the internet pretty easily. Um, or you could simplify even more, not even bother installing anything, and just come up with a system of like three basic rules. You don't really need that much formatting. Um, you just need everyone to be on the same page. Other questions? We didn't talk very much about like how to find disads that apply to a whole bunch of different topics, um, but I don't have like necessarily good rules for that. Um, just do your reading, I guess. <laughs> like, Everything is connected in some way. It's very like reading books helps a lot. Knowing things is like a really good idea as a general rule. What else? See, I, I learned co teaching college this like last year that um, if you open the floor for questions, what you're supposed to do is just stand silently and look at everyone. And uh, it's only when no one asks a question for like seven seconds or more that you are actually safe to move on. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, fire. Um, how many like for the? I didn't get to see the app part, but um, on the college the app part, like how in how in depth is it? Is just like how far down does the app part go? Because I know you have separate advantages. Yeah, um, so this M1 actually, I think the topics for NPTE this year, this was before they moved to specific resolutions, but it was all like clear enough that we had specific AF cases for each. So like um, NFU, you know, inherency, plan text, solvency, and then like two particular advantages for each, which are relatively, I mean, sort of developed, but not like really detailed. Um, and then we've got separate MG answers to likely neg arguments. Like this was back when New Start was being negotiated, so we've got that. Uh, this second strike app is the most cheater app I've ever cut in my life. Uh, it's still in my back file, and I want to use it someday, so you can't know about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I, it really would just depend um, how in depth and um, and how well you can anticipate the negative ground too. Like because if they could do anything, then probably put more energy into cutting the app and less into writing responses or something like that. Um, but I'd say for like an NPTE topic, which is the tournament that you would prep most for throughout the year, I think about 50 pages is probably the area that you want to be aiming for ideally. Um, again, depending. Um, not necessarily. Yeah? Out of curiosity, what was your link to what would cause the ADLs to be refunded? Oh, good question. We had a whole bunch of them. Um, we found a bunch of specific congressmen who were in like kind of uh, crucial swing districts and um, had lost, or, or and then we would make arguments that if they lost project funding um, under the plan for some reason, or the plan hurt their district in some way, it would make sense for them to fight to keep ABL alive because ABL had projects in their districts. That was a really good generic. Um, then we had like security threat type arguments, anything that increases U.S. perceived risk of sort of rogue states with missiles. Uh, would be a link because ABL could be used to counteract that. Uh, and then we had some like generic high tech sector links um, and like lobbyist links. Finding, oh, for politics disads guys or any sort of Washington trade off disad, find out, 
don't look at congressmen as much as lobbyists. Like, find out who the successful lobbyists are, and, like, we've read link arguments that are like, your plan causes Monsanto to hire X dude to lobby for them. Um, and this dude is the king of Washington and gets whatever he wants. The Coke bro now. Something like that. Obviously, that would not be an independent argument, but yeah. Yeah. What if we're from, like, a small school where you have two people <laughs> writing a 50-page file on 25 topics and stuff? Like, how would you... How do you, like, try to even that playing field? Completely agree, completely agree. Um, politics dissents and other sort of generic dissents are a lot like critiques in that they can be useful in a whole ton of different situations. So uh, instead of cheating, what you could do is write arguments about the consequences of a plan. Um, so a politics dissent would actually be a really, really great thing to have in your file if you're from uh, a small school. What you would need to do, what I would suggest is instead of trying to go broad with your research, go deep with your research. So find things that can be applied in tons of different rounds and use them over and over and over again um, wherever possible. And then over the course of the year, you can kind of diversify those arguments. But, but I think every small school that you know has had a ton of success has adopted that strategy to a greater or lesser extent. The only real exception would be CU Boulder. Um, and that doesn't count because Will Venturing is Will Venturing. Um, but like everybody else, it's like if you are small, you rely on getting really deep and really good on your favorite subjects. Uh, politics is that's a great way to do that. All right, guys. Uh, thanks.